was once a little girl with blonde hair which was frizzy like a sheep. Her name was Flora and she sang as sweetly as a little bird. When she grew up, she decided to become an opera singer. So she went to the big city and worked very hard with the help of a great singing instructor. She practiced from early in the morning to very late at night. She was always so busy working on her breathing exercises and scales that she became completely absent-minded. But she didn't care because she really wanted to be an opera singer. One day, the director of the Grand Opera Trial Alar telephoned her. Hello, he said. I'm looking for an opera singer and I'd like her to hear you sing. You're hired, he said as soon as he heard her voice. That was how Flora became an opera singer, and hundreds of people would come to hear her sing every night. One evening, a man gave Flora a huge bunch of flowers and said, I'm the tango dancer Tom. I love your voice. Tom came back every night. Flora found him charming and sweet, so when he asked her to marry him, she sang, Yes! in her loveliest voice possible. They got married, and soon they had a little baby girl. Then another baby girl. And a third baby girl. All three of them had blonde hair which was frizzy like a sheep. And they were called Catherine, Tabitha and Caroline. That was how Flora became a mother. She still sang whilst looking after her little girls. In fact, she spent so much time practicing her scales that she kept burning the food and forgetting to turn off the bath. Luckily, Tom was there to dance the tango and make them all forget. Flora swept her little girls up into her arms one day and promised, My darlings, this is going to stop. No more scales, no more breathing exercises, no more singing at home at all. No more problems with burnt food or spilt bath water from now on. That was how Flora became a perfect mother. But she no longer had time to practice her singing. So one night at the opera, her voice just cracked. The audience booed and jeered. The director screamed and Flora had to flee the stage. She became very depressed and thought, I'm no longer Flora the opera singer. I'm only Flora the fries maker, bath runner and shoe counter. And she began to cry. Her three daughters said, you know what, Mummy? We're grown up now, look. Tabitha said, I know my left from my right foot now. And Caroline said, I know how to turn the bath taps off. It's easy. And Catherine said, Rather than fries, I'd like to make cakes. When little girls grow up, it's a wonder what they can do. So Flora had time to practice her breathing exercises, to do her scales and to sing some arias. And after a while, she was allowed to sing at the Grand Opera Tralala again. Some nights, when there's no school the following day, three little girls with blonde frizzy hair like sheep can be found in the front row of the Grand Opera Tralala with their father. At the 
end of Flora's performance, as the audience applauds, you can hear Tabitha, Catherine and Caroline shouting, Well done, Mummy. You're the best mother and the best opera singer in the world. There once lived a king, a queen and their two children, Princess Marina and Prince Oliver. The only thing wrong with Prince Oliver was that he refused to wash. One morning, Queen Isabel said to him, My dear son, you really must wash. And he replied, My dear mother, your majesty, I'll only get dirty again playing. What's the point? That lunchtime, King Hubert asked him, Prince Oliver, my son, have you bathed? Prince Oliver answered, No, sir, King Hubert, my father. I wash my feet once a month. I think that's sufficient. Then that evening, Princess Marina shrieked, My dear brother, your ears are disgusting. He said, Sister dear, I can hear you quite well. Needless to ruin them by washing them. King Hubert thundered, My son, Prince Oliver, if you do not bathe, you'll have to sleep with the pigs. But Prince Oliver knew only too well that his father loved him too much to make him sleep with the pigs. Queen Isabel threatened, My son, if you don't wash, you'll have no more chocolate cake. But Prince Oliver knew his mother loved him far too much to deprive him of his favourite chocolate cake. And when Princess Marina refused to sit next to him anymore because he smelt so horrible, Prince Oliver started to cry. Since she loved her brother too much to see him cry, she sat straight down again next to him. Still, Prince Oliver wouldn't wash. Late one night, Queen Margaret, Prince Oliver's grandmother, arrived at the palace. She secretly gathered everyone in the palace around her, the king, the queen, Princess Marina, and all the cooks, servants, guards, and valets. The following morning, Prince Oliver was astonished to find dirty plates and bowls all over the dining room table. A servant explained that she no longer bothered with the washing up. He'll only get used and be dirty again. Prince Oliver thought this was disgusting. <laughs> the rest of the palace was also completely untidy. Scraps of paper, discarded food and spider's webs were everywhere. And the main parlour, well... Prince Oliver couldn't believe his eyes. The king, the queen, Princess Marina and also his grandmother were in a complete state. They were so dirty and they didn't even seem to care. Queen Margaret said, Oh, Prince Oliver, you were absolutely right. It's silly to wash every day when we'll only get dirty again. Therefore, we've decided only to wash once a year. That will definitely be enough. Prince Oliver was unhappy. Very unhappy indeed. He went to his bathroom and locked the door. A trickling sound could be heard throughout the palace. Everyone whispered, Prince Oliver's washing himself. He's cleaning himself. Everything in the palace was back to normal, just as before. Well, not entirely as before, because no one ever again said, Prince Oliver, go and wash yourself. There once lived a little emperor of China, all dressed in golden clothes, with a plait which was as long as he was tall. He had a dog called Beijing. His throne looked like a large dragon.
Often, the little emperor would ask his advisors, Tell me about the dragon. And they would tell him, It's the most terrifying one of all, the green-eyed dragon. No one but the emperor of China can slay him. But you are still too young. One day, the little emperor asked, How would I slay the dragon? And they answered, The emperor of China must talk to it without lying and write on its forehead, the little emperor of China. Then the dragon will be slain. That night, in his great big bed, the little emperor dreamt about the dragon. He was suddenly awoken by a little girl. Please help me. I'm from the fourth village. The green-eyed dragon has trapped everyone from my village in his cave. Only the Emperor of China can save them. You have to slay him. No sooner said, and the little emperor jumped up and said, I'll deal with it immediately. I'm bored here anyway, and I know how to slay the dragon. They passed through the first village, where everyone was starving. The dragon took all our food. We have nothing to eat. Give us your golden clothes and we'll sell them for food. So the little emperor gave them his clothes. In the second village, the people were dying of thirst. The dragon stole our water. We have only one well left and it's too deep. Give us your plait so we can lengthen our rope. The little emperor cut off his plait and they had water again. Everyone was crying in the third village. They explained, he's taken all the joy we had. Give us your little dog, he's sure to bring joy to our lives. The little emperor was very sad, but he gave them Beijing anyway. Then the little girl led him to the fourth village. By the hand. It was completely empty. All the villagers had indeed been taken prisoner in the cave. The little emperor was very frightened. He came before the dragon. Who are you, miserable child? growled the dragon. Thinking he would surely be devoured, he answered, I'm the emperor of China, because he knew he shouldn't lie. The emperor of China, eh? Where are your golden clothes, your long plait and your little dog, then? Go into the cave, you little liar. I'll eat you later. The dragon went to sleep. The little emperor approached it slowly, quietly, and very quickly he wrote the words, the little emperor of China, on his forehead. The dragon then opened its eyes, which it turned blue, and said, You didn't lie. You truly are the emperor of China. Your wish is my command. The little emperor of China asked for the entire fourth village to be set free. He asked for feasts and water and food for the other villagers. And he asked for his little dog, Beijing. From then on, the little emperor of China could tell his advisors all about dragons and never had to ask them anything again. Eddie and Julian are neighbours. Eddie lives in a trailer and Julian lives in the house next door. Julian's mummy tells him, I don't want you playing with that boy from the trailer. And Eddie's mum tells him, I don't want you playing with that boy from the house. When Eddie and Julian go to school, they walk on opposite sides of the street. At night, Julian tells his mum, I didn't play with Eddie. And Eddie tells his mum, I didn't play with Julian. And both their mummies say, That's, That's good. good. They're, They're not, not like us. us. One day, the whole school goes on an outing to the countryside. They all have great fun playing by a stream.
suddenly it starts to rain very hard. All the school children take shelter under the trees, except Eddie and Julian who run for cover beneath the roof of a nearby hut. They're still getting wet, so they go inside. They each sit in their own corner. They look at each other in silence. They don't play. They do nothing. They don't even hear the rain stop or the other children leave. They don't even notice nightfall. And then, at the same time, they realise they've all gone home and forgotten us. Eddie says, Oh, well, this is like a trailer. Don't be scared. And Julian says, Oh, well, it's like a house here. Don't be scared. Do you know the way home? No, it's too dark. We'll have to wait till morning. Eddie says, Are you cold? Take my jumper. Julian says, Are you cold? Here's my jacket. They get on the bed and fall fast asleep. Some time later, in the middle of the night, people are searching all over for them. And Julian's mummy is calling, Julian, where are you? And Eddie's mummy's calling, pitch black inside the little hut. Julian's mummy says, That's Julian's jacket. That's my Julian. And Eddie's mummy says, That's Eddie's jumper. That's my Eddie. The fuses have short-circuited in the house, so it's very dark. And the oil lamp has run out of oil in the caravan. It's hard to see anything. The next morning, Eddie and Julian's mums go to wake up their sons. But Julian is asleep in Eddie's bunk. And Eddie is dreaming in Julian's bed. Their mummies look at each other and they smile. Now Eddie and Julian play together and their mothers are the best of friends. Sometimes they play by the green trailer with the blue curtains and sometimes by the blue house with the green curtains. Timothy Whoopsie-Daisy was the son of a witch, the grandson of a witch and the great-grandson of a witch. Yet he wasn't even close to being a wizard. The first major mistake came with his birth. You see, he was born a boy, whereas it was the custom in his family to give birth to girls. Great-grandmother couldn't stop moaning. It's really quite simple to create a witch. All you need is a big nose, warts, ears that stick out and a healthy appetite for evil. <laughs> Trying to make up for her huge mistake, Timothy's mother said, But he is a bit ugly. He looks like a toad. We all know that it's normal for newborn babies to look wrinkled, but it doesn't mean they won't grow up into beautiful children. And alas, that's exactly what happened. When Timothy was four, he was as pretty as a picture and sweet too. But he tried very hard to be a wizard and always helped his three sisters to practice their spells. This is a spell for catching toads. Turn the toad into a pot! This is a spell to turn them into small pots. But he didn't want to learn himself because it made him unhappy to make others unhappy. His mother was very worried she couldn't possibly take him along to witching night. She'd be too embarrassed. But 
she didn't dare leave him with a fairy babysitter. So, one night, she asked the advice of the wisest witch of all, Dimothy's great-grandmother. Oh, there's nothing for it, said the old witch. As of tomorrow, you'll have to enrol him in a wizard school. The head wizard inspected Timothy. He has a tiny nose and no warts on his face. How unfortunate. But as a sign of respect for the family, the wizard allowed Timothy to stay anyway. A year later, Timothy was sent home wearing a dunce's hat and carrying a report card for his mother which read, Tries hard, no ability with evil, Possible to train as a wizard. Left with her three daughters, each a better witch than the next, his poor mother had had a terrible time. Every time the first one had a nightmare, she'd cast this magic spell. I will, I will, I will wake him up! Each time the second one had a chore to do, she'd cast this spell. I will, I will, I will give it to and each time the third one was in a bad mood, she'd cast the spell, I will, I will annoy my mum. Of course, she could have cast a spell on them to teach them a lesson, but no mummy, not even a witch, ever turned her daughters into toads. Timothy came home just in time. Without the help of potions or magic spells, he miraculously sorted everything out. Timothy's mother told him, My dear, seeing how well you've organised everything since you came home makes me think that perhaps you're a magician. Timothy replied, Mummy, you know as well as I do that you need long and very dark hair, big blue eyes, a little chin and a shining wand to be a magician. I am neither a magician nor a wizard, but just your little boy. All I need to cast a spell on you is a kiss. Charlotte lives in a cottage with her mummy, her daddy and her dog Fleabag. Behind the cottage is a large field overgrown with wild flowers. It's for sale, but Charlotte hopes that no one will ever buy it. When she's not at school, Charlotte puts on her American Indian costume and goes to play in the field next door with Fleabag. When Fleabag gets sick of playing a mean bear or a wild dog, he wanders off leaving Charlotte, the Indian, to play pretend. There is an old bent apple tree in the middle of the field. Charlotte climbs onto it, pretending it's a canoe, and rides it downstream, chanting her little Indian song. The apple tree canoe carries her past the great prairie where the old buffalo and wild horses roam. Today, Charlotte's decided she'll carry on down the wild green river to the land of the mean Yaka Yaka tribe. But what's this? A horrible, large, noisy machine is tearing through the field. No! Stop! She cries. But it's too late. Charlotte's canoe is gone. Charlotte is very upset. Time goes by. Some workmen arrive to build a house with a large garage. The garage is just over the place where her canoe was. A new family moves in next door with a little boy the same age as Charlotte. 
he stores his bicycle in the garage. She hates him. Charlotte is bored. <sighs> she doesn't dress up anymore. She doesn't have fun anymore. She doesn't even play with Fleabag anymore. And then one day she bumps into the little boy at the baker's. He says his name is Sebastian and that he's bored. He explains that he had lots of friends to play Indians with before he moved. And of course he has his own Indian costume. So, Charlotte and Sebastian start playing Indians together. Then Sebastian says, I'll get my bike from the garage and pretend it's a horse. I hate your bike, I hate your garage even more, and you're worse than a yakka yakka, screams Charlotte. Sebastian is confused, but he can see that Charlotte's upset about something, so he waits. Charlotte starts to explain about the buffalo and the wild horses and the great prairie. She describes the green river and finally the apple tree canoe. Sebastian explains that he had lots of old toys he loved but his parents threw them out when they moved. He understands this is not the same but he can see her point of view. Then Charlotte says you know what, Sebastian? I'm glad your house was built next to mine. But it's a shame they had to bury my canoe under your garage. There once was a farmer and his dog. And the farmer would say, Here, dog. Lie down, dog. Stand up, dog. The dog did everything he could possibly do to please his master. except he constantly nagged him for a kennel. If only I had my own place to rest. The farmer also had a cat, who meowed all day. Meow, open the door for me, will you? If only I could have my own little flat, then I could come and go to my important appointments whenever I want. But the farmer really didn't have time to make a dog kennel or a cat flap. Then one day, a fox stole one of the farmer's chickens. The farmer told his dog, If you stop the fox from stealing my chickens, I'll build you that kennel you want so much. Well, get my kennel before you get your flat, bragged the dog to the cat. I won't hold my breath. That night, the dog guarded the chicken coop. He went round and round and round it. In fact, he went round it so often that when the fox pounced, he was too tired to chase after it. The following day, the dog had a plan. Listen, pig, you have to help me. If you see the fox approaching, squeal as loud as you can to warn me. The pig agreed. That night, the pig took his post, but he fell asleep. And the fox got away. So the next day, the dog went to the sheep. You must help me. When you see the fox, Bow loudly to warn me, the sheep agreed. But that night, when the sheep stood guard, he heard lots of strange noises and he was so frightened that he covered his eyes and his teeth chattered. Then the fox attacked. The farmer was very disappointed. This is your chance, cat. If you stop the fox, I'll make that flap you're after. The dog laughed. What? The cat frightened a large fox? That'll be the day. The cat ran to the attic to speak to the mice. Now, don't be afraid. If you stop the fox from stealing the farmer's chickens, I promise never to eat you again. A little mouse squeaked. I've got an idea. Psst. That night, the mice were to sit by the chicken coop.
Then one mouse held two glowworms above his head and all the other mice formed a file behind him. When the fox turned up, they all hissed together. I'm the snake! And the fox was terrified. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Snake, I never meant to bother you! And the mice hissed. Tss, tss. Go away then and don't ever come back! And the fox cried, I promise, I promise! As he ran off. The next morning, the delighted farmer built the cat flap as promised. The dog was nearly in tears. So the cat took the farmer to one side and said, Why don't you build the dog a kennel too? He tries so hard to please you, he deserves it. That night, everyone on the farm was happy. The chickens in their coop, the farmer in his armchair, the mice in the attic, the dog in his kennel, and the cat. Well, the cat could now come and go as he wished, to his very important appointments. Somewhere in Africa, a very long way from here, an old hippopotamus called Bertie Bubble Blur was snoozing in a warm, calm river. Bertie Bubble Blur was always kind to little children. He would help them across the river by taking them on his back. He was really friendly, except when people made fun of him. He didn't like that at all. In a nearby village lived Marla and her little brother Mackie. They love splashing and playing in the water. One day, Mackie started to tease Bertie Bubble Blur. That hippo is so big and fat, he is ridiculous. Bertie didn't react. He simply looked at Mackie in a very curious way. The following day, Marla and Mackie needed to cross the river. Being the oldest, Marla knew how to talk to hippos. She called to him, Dear beautiful hippo, you swim so fast and you're so strong. Please carry us across the river. Bertie very much liked this little girl because she always said lovely things to him. Of course, Marla, climb onto my back, he said. But tell your brother to keep his mouth shut or I don't know what I may do to him. Mackie was perfectly behaved. He didn't tease and he didn't whisper. On the other side of the river, the children picked lots and lots of bananas. That evening, Marla repeated, Dear beautiful hippo, you swim so fast and you're so strong. Please take us back across the river. Bertie grinned with delight underwater, creating enormous bubbles which carried him to the surface. This time, Mackie didn't want to behave. He pinched his nose and teased Bertie. What's that nasty smell? Oh, it's the hippopotamus. Mackie should never have said that. Bertie opened his gigantic mouth and in one go he swallowed Mackie whole. Marla cried and begged Bertie Bubble Blower to give Mackie back to her. But Bertie refused because of the nasty things Mackie had said. Marla ran back to tell her parents and the villagers. Her parents begged, Please give us back our son, Hippopotamus. He's too young. He doesn't understand. He'll never do it again. Bertie Bubble Blur wouldn't spit Mackie out. Then the villagers cried, If you give him back, we'll cut down a thousand reeds for you. But Bertie Bubble Blur pretended not to hear them. Night fell and Bertie Bubble Blur got a bad stomach ache because Mackie was hitting and kicking him from inside. He grumbled to the villagers. Oh, all right, I'll take those reeds now. And he spat Mackie back out. The villagers laughed with delight. 
To thank Bertie Bubbleblower for his kindness, they all agreed to cut reeds for him for three whole days and nights. They sang a special song for him about a little boy who came back out of a hippo's tummy. Maggie was so tired that he fell asleep in his mother's arms. Mr Lion was invited to a New Year's Eve party. What fun, he thought. I'll see my dear friends again and I can show the children my new party tricks. I'd better not keep them waiting. No sooner said than Mr Lion was on his way. When he arrived, the whole family was waiting on the front porch. He couldn't resist showing them his first trick before they even got inside. Then he handed over the flowers. They all sat down to dinner, which Anna the maid had prepared for them specially. Excitedly, the children pleaded, Shall us have a trick, Mr Lion, please? This request, of course, delighted Mr Lion, who was only too pleased to oblige. The whole family cried with laughter. In fact, they laughed so hard that one of Mother's earrings fell off and rolled under the table. Everyone got down on their knees to help search for it. Except Mr Lion, who was busy chewing a large bone. It was at that moment that Anna appeared from the kitchen, and all she saw was Mr Lion alone, licking a large bone. She screamed and ran out of the house as fast as her legs could carry her. She found a telephone booth and called the police. Oh, please, uh, quickly, there's a lion in the house. It's eating everyone and it's after me now. The police surrounded the house. A trainer from the circus put up cables and nets for capturing wild animals and brought along his whip. They barged into the house and saw... Mr. Lion doing another trick. And around him, the whole family, safe and well, enjoying themselves. No one had been eaten. And Mr. Lion continued to show the whole crowd all his new tricks. Everyone clapped and cheered. and screamed, do another! Mother smiled at her unexpected guests, offered them cake and explained. It was just a little misunderstanding. Here's my hardest one yet, said Mr Lion. When his hardest party trick was over, it was way past bedtime. And he yawned, Oh, good night, everyone. And as they all watched him leave, they wondered what new trick he would come up with even before he got home.
There once was a beautiful girl called Maggie. All the boys wanted to marry her. Every day, one of them would knock at her door. Tap, 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 tap. I love you, please marry me, they would say. But Maggie didn't want to get married. She preferred to live alone so she could get up when she wanted, eat eggs with her jelly, put her elbows on the table and pick her nose. One day, she had a plan. The next time she heard tap, 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 I love you, please marry me, she replied. Well then, come in. The boy was astonished. Oh, I didn't know she had such an ugly nose. He changed his mind about marrying her and quickly disappeared. Yep, hey, good riddance, Maggie said. The next day there was another knock at the door. Tap, tap, tap. I love you, please marry me. Come in. The boy was shocked and quickly ran off. Yippee, good riddance, she said again. And the day after, when another boy knocked at her door, she again asked him to come in. But he didn't stay for long. Yippee, and good riddance, she sang. At last, Maggie was left alone. Nobody knocked at her door anymore. Then, one day, she no longer wanted to be alone, so she went in search of a boy to marry. But they were all already married. There was only one boy left. And he liked to live alone. To get up when he wanted, sing at the top of his voice and put his feet on the table and let his horse live in the house with him. Maggie knocked on his door. Tap, tap, tap. I'm looking for someone to marry. Come in, please, he replied. She went in and came straight back out. Oh, no, I don't like you at all. And she left. He'd disguised himself because he didn't want to get married. But he really liked Maggie. He ran after her. Wait! He washed his face. I love you. I'd love to marry you. Maggie liked the way he looked too. All right, I'll marry you if I can eat my eggs with jelly and bathe with my clothes on, she said. All agree, as long as I can put my feet on the table and sing really loudly. They decided to continue doing whatever they wanted as long as they didn't annoy each other. Maggie didn't pick her nose and he made his horse sleep alone in the stable. When they got married, everyone threw a great big party for them. And sometimes, neighbours would pass by their house and look in and see Maggie with her elbows on the table, laughing merrily whilst her husband sang at the top of his voice. <laughs> Miss Sophie Scissors made beautiful wedding dresses and all the young ladies in the land wanted Sophie to make their dresses so they could be the prettiest brides. One day, the postman arrived with a letter for Sophie. It said, I'm getting married on Saturday. Please make me a dress with a million folds and a train six metres long. And it was signed, Miss the Most Beautiful. Sophie went to work on the dress. She cut and she ironed and she folded.
postman said. I'll finish work for today. I, I could help you. As they worked, he told her funny stories and she giggled along. When the postman left that evening, Sophie continued working until midnight. The following morning, the postman returned with another letter. It said, well, I've changed my mind. I'd look better in a short little dress with millions of buttons on it. It was from Miss The Most Beautiful. Sophie was none too pleased. She's a regular little miss, isn't she? The postman said, Don't worry, Miss Sophie. I've finished my rounds for today. Let me help you. And as they worked, he sang and Sophie sang with him. At the end of the day, the postman left and Sophie carried on working until midnight. But the next day, the postman came back with another letter. It said, I've made up my mind. I'd look even prettier than a dress covered with roses from the veil down to the train. This time, Sophie was angry. And the postman said, Look, I'll pick the roses and we can sew them on together tonight. When the postman left, the dress was finished. But the following day, the postman returned with a new letter. I've reconsidered. I'd be even more beautiful in a heart-shaped dress covered in little bunches of flowers. The postman got ready to help, but Sophie was furious. Tell her she can do it herself. I don't care if she turns up in a picnic basket. Softly, the postman said, We'll make this heart-shaped dress together, Miss Sophie. I'll deliver my letters tomorrow, or maybe next week. The postman left after dark. Sophie stayed up till midnight. She felt a bit like writing poetry. The postman turned up with another letter. Well, for the change of heart, I'm going to make the dress with my own hands. What could be more beautiful than that? You're invited to the party, and so's the postman. Miss Sophie and the postman danced together all night. They decided to get married. They made Sophie's wedding dress together with millions of buttons and folds and a train a mile long covered in little bunches of flowers. This is why on her wedding day Miss Sophie really was Miss The Most Beautiful. Eddie lives in a green trailer with blue curtains. Julian lives next door in a blue house with green curtains. Every morning they walk to school together. And at lunchtime, they share each other's sandwiches. After school, they go and play on an abandoned property. They play hide and seek and other games, like pretending to be aliens or animals from the jungle. Countryside isn't far off, and sometimes a shepherd passes by with flocks of sheep. One Saturday morning, when they wake up and look out of their windows, it's snowing.
So Julian puts on his red jumper and yellow hat, and Eddie puts on his red hat and yellow jumper. They run over to their field to play. They build an igloo and make a snowman. Suddenly, Eddie stops still. Did you hear that? Maybe it's an alien monster. And Julian says, it came from over there. Shall we go and take a look? There's a rusty old dented car at the far end of the property. They approach it together and look inside. Lying down all alone is a sheep. She must be cold. I'll make her a trailer so she'll be warm, says Eddie. She must be cold. I'll build her a hut so she'll be warm, says Julian. No, a trailer. We can move her around, insists Eddie. No, a hut. It's cosy like a house, retorts Julian. A trailer, screams Eddie. A hut, screams Julian. A trailer, a hut. So they continue to argue and say nasty things to each other. They're angry. So Eddie goes home to his trailer and Julian returns home to his flat. After lunch, they go back but walk on opposite sides of the street. They're still angry with each other. The sheep is still there, but now there are two newborn lambs with her. How sweet, says Eddie. I'll take one and make it a trailer. They're so soft, says Julian. I'll take one and build it a hut. Eddie goes off to make a trailer out of an old cart and canopy. And Julian finds some old planks and builds a little hut. But the sheep comes to fetch her little lambs from Eddie's trailer in Julian's hut. So Eddie and Julian laugh and smile at each other. Eddie gets the canopy from his little trailer and Julian gets the planks from his little hut and they put them around the old car. Now the sheep is lovely and warm with her babies. And when they see the shepherd, Eddie and Julian run up to him. Over here! We found one of your sheep! He carefully bundles the lambs beneath his cloak to protect them from the cold, and the sheep follows him away happily. Eddie and Julian decide to go home. This time they walk hand in hand. Chloe dreamt of having a pair of pretty shoes in which she could run, jump and click her heels. But her father always wanted her to wear sturdy boots. Every morning he would ask, Have you put on your sturdy boots? You'll be less frail in them. They went walking in the woods and she plucked some acorns. Oh, I hate these army boots. I'm not frail. I just want shoes I can run, jump and click my heels in, complained Chloe. When she came home, her mother moaned, Oh, you're still wearing those horrible boots. Take them off and put on your fluffy slippers. You look as pretty as a picture in your slippers. Good girl. But the slippers were so thick and hot that Chloe's feet swelled up. She played with her grey mouse and pulled out two of its whiskers. She grumbled, I'm not a good girl. I hate these granny slippers. I want shoes I can run and jump and click my heels in. When she visited her grandparents, her grandfather said, Here, put on these wooden clogs. You look like a real farmer now. Chloe thought, I'm not a farmer. I hate these clogs. I want some shoes I can run and jump and click my heels in. Her grandfather gave her a cow horn. Grandmother screamed when Chloe tried to get into the house. Oh, not with those filthy clogs, dear. Take them off quickly and put on these floor polished cloth skates. Oh, you're such a considerate child. How lovely. 
Chloe stroked her grandmother's cat and put a large soft ball of fur in her pocket. I'm not considerate. I don't like these cleaning cloth skates. I want a pair of shoes I can run and jump and click my heels in. When Chloe visited her godmother, she said, Tie up these lovely satin ballet shoes. Ah, oh, you're such a graceful little girl. To please her godmother, Chloe danced on tiptoe, but she said, I'm not graceful. I don't like these show-off shoes. Her godmother gave her two clips for her hair. Her uncle took her climbing. Put on these mountain boots. What a beautiful climber you make. Not a climber. I hate these outdoor boots. I want shoes I can run, jump and click my heels in. Chloe found a dead lizard and had an idea. She went to the cobbler. On the counter, she lay down four acorns, two mouse whiskers, a ball of cat fur, a cow horn, two golden clips, and two lizard skins. And she asked, Can you make me a pair of shoes with these? And he answered, With this stuff? Hmm, let me see. I can only make shoes for running and jumping and clicking your heels. They'll be ready tomorrow. And the next day, Chloe went back to the cobbler for the most delicate shoes you could ever imagine. They were made out of lizard skin, covered in cat fur, with cow horn soles, mouse whisker laces, and decorated with two acorns held by a golden buckle. They were just the shoes for running, jumping and clicking her heels in. <laughs>